Alan, in my early education, I did uh, work in a laboratory in molecular biology in the early days. I remember what that was. And I remember my thinking during those days. And I, I never thought I would ever need a philosopher to help me do what I, I did. Uh, why would I need a philosopher if I'm a molecular biologist? Molecular biology is one of the most intensely pragmatic areas of biology where it would seem like any sort of conceptual reflection is simply not needed. We just need to sequence the next gene and keep moving. However, it's clear that some of the key categories in molecular biology, most notably the gene, are susceptible to lots of differences of meaning and those differences of meaning can actually have an impact on how research is done. So you're saying meaning of genes. Do you mean the sequence, like what's a codon, how many nucleotides are in a codon? I mean, that's a technical well, question. And when people say this is due to a genetic factor, they, I, they can mean quite different things. Okay. Some could mean that's due to a change in the open reading frame that affects the sequence of the protein. Somebody might mean that's a change in the regulatory region that affects the expression of the protein. And some people may have no idea what the mechanistic uh, import is, but they know there's a single nucleotide polymorphism that's different. And so they can at least track a difference even if they don't know what the difference means or how it's, how it's operating. So all of that kind of complexity exists when people talk about genes, genetic contributions, uh, genetic analysis, and the like. At the same time, it's not just about those sorts of categories. So let's shift to proteins for a minute, because proteins are a place where you might think, what's philosophical about proteins? But there's a couple different things that are interesting about proteins. One is, how do you classify them, right? We have all kinds of proteins that get grouped into different classifications. Are they <coughs> particular signaling molecules? Are they structural proteins? Um, and in those cases, I'm emphasizing functional features of proteins to group them together. But I might also group them together based on sequence homology. And they're grouped together, even though they do different things, mm. they have mm -hmm. similar structures. So there's really interesting questions about, well, which classification should we adopt? Is one better than another? Or maybe we need to have multiple classifications. Oh, it seems multiple makes multiple sense. Multiple makes sense, and it's actually what we see in practice. In addition to classification, we also have questions about prediction versus explanation. Protein folding is a great place to see this. There's all this excitement right now about alpha fold and alpha fold being able to predict protein structure. And alpha fold Hundreds of thousands. is an amazing tool and we should be excited about it. However, what alpha fold doesn't do is tell you actually how proteins fold. Because of the way the algorithms work, they're not paying attention to the mechanistic details of protein folding. And if you wanted to understand how, particular proteins were actually folding in a cellular environment, alpha fold will not help you. Can we distinguish between the ability to predict a protein structure given the sequence from the ability to explain why a sequence and Why is that significant? Because that's, well, prediction is not the same thing as explanation and we typically don't think we have understanding with prediction alone. Prediction alone tells me what I can know will happen, but it doesn't tell me why. It doesn't tell me how. It doesn't give me the details. And just to be practical, if, if you're designing a, a new drug to either enhance or nullify a particular protein, whether it's good or bad for you or something, for a disease, um, does it matter how, how, how it occurred? Why would that matter if you know the structure and that's, what, and that's the prediction, then you can design a uh, pharmaceutical to, uh, to deal with that. But, how that happened, the explanation, why would that be relevant? So let's just think about this in a simple hypothetical example. Proteins fold very quickly yep. in the cellular environment, but they do fold through sequences. In that folding sequence, they have different chemical uh. interactions that are possible. Okay. If my prediction tells me nothing about that sequence, I cannot understand why there might be side effects 
in the cellular context for a particular treatment unless I understand those details. And those details didn't come from the prediction. They came from the mechanistic explanation. Because explanation. It's, it, it's not an instant result. It's, it's, it's a process that may happen it happens you know, very, fast. very, very fast, but, but it, there, there are steps in the process to get that fold. Right. Uh, and, and what that does is that opens up or it says that, that if you, if you want to deal with side effects or the implication, you, you might have had an intervention at an earlier stage in the process, if you can understand that. Mm -hmm. And you can think about contextual factors. To what degree am I looking at protein folding independent of the cellular context? To what degree am I looking at protein folding in light of a particular cellular context? Because, in fact, we know that there are particular proteins in uh, our bodies that are the same protein but do very different things in different contexts. Sure. Right? So the lens crystallins in our eyes are very good at being stable globular proteins that pass light through them in an effective way, but they're related to and expressed from the same uh, genes that are also a part of the active liver enzymes hmm. that we have. And the in the liver, they're not passing light through in a stable globular form. <laughs> right. And so what's the significance of that? So the significance of that is that when we pay attention to distinctions between prediction, explanation, explanation in one context rather than another, we recognize the fine scale detail of our knowledge and we know what we don't know. And, and it can point scientists uh, to areas they may not have considered before, mm -hmm. but, but just the clarity of the differentiation between explanation and prediction. And also, I think, illuminates an important feature of the division of labor in the sciences, right. which is that not all the sciences do the same kind of work. And it doesn't mean that one kind of work is better than another, but it does mean that we can't recognize that other people's uh, approaches are somehow not as relevant because they don't do what I do. If scientist A works on prediction and scientist B works on an explanation, ideally what we'd like is for them to work together, but also to realize that what they do makes different contributions. And when you work with scientists, and I know that's something that, that you, uh, you, you do and, and you, you emphasize the importance of that, literally working with scientists, uh, I'm sure the ones that you work with are appreciative, but is the general community appreciative? Because I don't have that sense. It's a hard question to answer because the number of philosophers compared to the number of scientists <laughs> is such an amazing discrepancy. Yeah. Um, the scientists, well, supposed to say that's good. Some people might say that's good. Yeah. Scientists I work with, I've had very good uh, outcomes, very productive interactions. I think that more generally, it depends a lot on people's experience. And I would imagine that there are many scientists who have never talked to a philosopher and probably are not ever seeking one out. <laughs> <laughs>